And today, this webinar is focused on Thrips parva pinus. Um, and this is a um, special alert about this pest and a call for action and help from the Master Gardener volunteers and landscapers from across the states. Um, so we could really use your help. So this is why we're doing this webinar today. And our presenters today, um, we will be led by Dr. Lance Osborne. He is professor of entomology and the associate center director at UF Mid Florida Research and Education Center, and that is located in Apopka. And hopefully Nicole Benda will join us from the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. She's having some tech issues. So Lance is gonna be doing the heavy lifting for us today. So um, it is our pleasure to get started with this presentation. We have about 200 people already signed on. I want to say one other thing. When you exit the Zoom webinar, you will be sent to a survey. And Dr. Osborne really wants your feedback on this survey. So please go ahead and take that survey for us today. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop share. And Dr. Osborne, if you would go ahead and start sharing, we will go ahead and get this uh, special pest alert webinar kicked off. Thank you for being here. Okay. I appreciate the opportunity to, let's see, I'm trying to get rid of this. Okay, there we go. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, reach out to the Master Gardener group. They can be in, instrumental in helping us track invasive species. If it wasn't for master gardeners, we wouldn't have had the early warning system that occurred uh, with pink hibiscus mealybug. Uh, it was uh, an individual uh, master gardener that found it and reported it early and helped us uh, get biological control going quickly so it wasn't nearly the pest or didn't develop into the pest we were afraid of. So again, it's absolutely critical. I'm gonna talk about a new thrips species that's invaded Florida. Now, uh, we had a kind of a, a thing choreographed with myself and uh, Dr. Benda, but I'm going to keep going until she signs in or just uh, full steam ahead. Uh, there's a lot of different names. We call it uh, uh, in, in Florida two different things. Uh, they're calling it a two spine thrips and DPI, and then there are a number of other people calling it a pepper thrips. In, in science, we try to go with the Latin name because it's more specific. We know exactly what species we're talking about generally, unless there's cryptic species. Uh, but we know we're what we're talking about if we just call it parvospinus, parvi and then spinous, okay? Uh, too many common names, get, everything gets confused. We don't end up not knowing what we're talking about. So it, it's critical to try to get uh, that squared away. Until Dr. The, Lance, are you yeah. are you sharing yet? Yeah. Okay, I can't see it. So okay, let me try it let's again. Try again. Okay, share. All right, and then make it a slideshow. Yeah. Okay. All All right. Right. Thank you. You got it. All right. I'm gonna okay. go ahead. You got the floor now. I'm gonna sign. Okay. Uh, so again, just different names. Uh, we will, I will probably be using parvospinus throughout my talk. Uh, just some objectives of this talk, basically. This is something's not happening here, right? Okay, so some of the objectives. One is to alert everybody uh, that we do have a new invasive species. Uh, we want to expose you to what this new pest looks like to get as many uh, eyes and uh, people looking for this particular pest so we know what its distribution is, which is critical to its management. We need to know uh, where it's at. It does change how the Department of Agriculture uh, FDAX responds to it, depending on where it's at and established. Uh, we'll talk about some of the gaps in our knowledge in biology and management and, and the distribution. One of the problems with an invasive species, we generally don't know they're coming. And when they arrive, uh, we know very little about them. We don't know that much about their biology. We don't know that much about their management. And certainly, uh, we struggled to find out the early distribution of where things are at. 
Well, finally, uh, at the end, talk a little bit about discussing uh, discuss sampling, sentinel plants, and cooperative projects that we would like to get started with the master gardeners. Okay, I'm going to transfer to my website. Uh, Nicole, uh, Dr. Binda wanted me to, to go over the website and show uh, some of the, the materials that are there. Uh, so I'm just going to scroll down on the website. This is a combined effort from a number of different people uh, in Florida. Uh, USDA, Dr. Revenenti down at Homestead, Dr. McKenzie at USDA, myself. Now, this is, we would like you to, to figure out and make sure you know how to get to this website so you can keep up to, uh, to up on the latest that we're doing. Uh, my email is here. So you know where to get it. And if you have questions or you want to participate in some of the things we're going to mention toward the end, I uh, would like to have you send me emails so I can make sure we can communicate uh, a little bit easier. Okay, this you can see we do try to update this as often as possible. Uh, so there's lots of lots of websites, lots of uh, webinars that have been taped uh, that we have links to. Uh, there's some a couple other scientists. Uh, they have this particular pest in Canada. So we have a, a very active group up in Canada. Uh, they're, they have a little bit easier task working with this because Canada hasn't treated this as an invasive species or a regulated pest. So they can work at it uh, on it in their greenhouses. Dr. Revanthi and myself have to have a little bit more difficult of a time trying to work with it. Uh, Dr. Reventi has generated a lot of data on how to manage it with certain pesticides, but these are in petri dishes in the lab or in a re in a uh, confined. Uh, it's not much bigger than a broom closet, but she's she's done an amazing amount of work figuring out how sensitive these are under petri dish lab conditions to various pesticides. This is the adult female parvospinus. Now, the important thing is that this thing has a dark abdomen, and then this front portion of the thrips is kind of very light tan in color. It looks like people have mimic or mentioned that it looks like it's wearing a, a, a light colored jacket. It's two toned. And so when we're trying to get people to detect it and see if they have the strips on their plant, we tell them, first of all, see if you see any tiny, little tiny black or dark things moving around on the leaf, or when you beat it against a white piece of paper, you see something, little tiny thing moving around very, that's kind of dark in color. With a little bit of magnification, you can see that it has a, a dark abdomen and a, again, a light uh, thorax. Okay, uh, a couple other things that there's a lot of different dark thrips in the state of Florida that we could confuse these with, but they differ in size. Some of them are, are fairly good sized, and then there's a lot of light ones. So uh, color can make a difference uh, in helping you identify this, and then size. So you start to, when you start looking at the leaves and things crawling around on them, you're, you're going to realize that, you know, that a lot of the things can be ruled out. This is kind of a, a naked uh, eye view, uh, unaided. This is about what you see. It's not much bigger than a, the head of a, a pencil lead, okay? With some magnification, a 10X hand lens, you will see that dark abdomen, front thorax, uh, light thorax, 20X. Okay, this is a shot on the leaf, and you will also start to see if there's a thrips present, you will start to see these little blotches. They can either be black in color. In this case, they're green. This is the excrement of the thrips that's going along, feeding on the cells and, and feeding on the contents of the epidermal cells, and it causes a silver and gray uh, uh, scar. Okay, now in this slide, you can see them running around on a, I think it's an eggplant or leaf. And that's an adult female, okay? So you can see that they are two-toned. Now the male looks a lot like chili thrips. Chili thrips is a different species altogether, okay? Some people have been saying this is chili thrips. No, this is parvus minus, and the other is chili thrips. And here's the male. 
So you'll see a lot of these that look a lot like chili thrips, but you really need to see the female. That's what's diagnostic. We don't really worry about things that look like the male. Okay. Now I was going to transfer to Dr. Binda, but she's not here. So now I've got to, I'm sorry, have to uh, pull up a different PowerPoint and see if I can give her. Okay. So sampling for thrips is one of the things that we really need some help with and you know, trying to teach the folks that are attending. If we can get some uh, volunteers to try to find plants that may have this particular pest uh, attacking them around the state. So again, like we, like we mentioned, uh, the thrips 20X here, my computer's acting on its own. Uh, and then we have uh, a blossom. So basically we had a crew go from one end of the state to the other along up uh, I-95 and back down 75 and looking for thrips in some of the larger retail outlets uh, out of like 23 places uh, that were uh, surveyed from Palm Beach County up to the, to the, the Georgia border and back down. 23, I think it was 22 out of 23 were positive, had plants in their uh, inventory that were going to be sold that had the thrips in it. Now, one of the earliest ways to find them is to look in the blossoms. Okay, sometimes you don't see any damage on the plant, but when you start looking in the blossoms, you may see some very tiny black thrips running around. And they aren't as easily dislodged when you uh, tap the leaves against the, or the plant against the, the white background. So you do need to look in the blossoms and it's, you don't end up uh, getting chased out of a retail outlet as, quite as readily if you just look in the blossom as opposed to beating the plant against a black or a white uh, board. You're going to find a couple different thrips. Again, chili thrips, which is much larger. We used to think this was the very tiny, but this one is much more tiny. This is the, considered the smallest thrip species found in the state of Florida. There's a very large host range or list of, uh, of plants that this particular uh, thrips is uh, feeding, attacking on or has attacked. Now, just because we somebody in the world found it on a particular plant doesn't necessarily mean that these are good hosts or reproductive hosts. We found them on some roses, but they were just on a flower in close vicinity to some infested plants. Uh, it's listed as being a major pest of papaya, but we've never had any uh, thrips go on to papaya that at least didn't have flowers or fruit on it. Now we need to double check to see if it's the flowers and the fruit that they're attracted to. So just because it's on a list doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be a, a good host. There are a number of hosts that we did find that we concentrate uh, our efforts on, and that is, uh, Basically, we look at Asclepius. This is one that shows damage very quickly after being exposed to the thrips. You can see the damage on the top of the leaves. Here, I, I don't know if you can see my uh, mouse arrow, but again, you can see some black dots where the excrement is and then the outline of a thrips. Uh, these are very good. This is We've seen these in a lot of different retail stores that are infested, and we use these as sentinel plants around our greenhouses here at the research center to see if we can find thrips in other people's greenhouses. Uh, peppers is one that is very, very uh, sensitive to the thrips. One grower down in Palm Beach County lost a million point three uh, dollars uh, to the strips because he had never seen it before, didn't recognize the damage, thought it was broad mites, used uh, mite materials that didn't have any impact on the thrips, and basically the whole crop was destroyed, uh, lost all the flowers, all the fruit. Uh, so again, capsicum, it, it didn't, doesn't really matter whether a sweet pepper or a one of the hot peppers or ornamental peppers. Uh, Another plant that is moving around on uh, quite significantly is gardenia. 
Uh, we've seen a lot of damage in landscapes uh, on Gardenia in the Palm Beach County area. It looks like somebody hit them with a blowtorch. Uh, the, the new growth is dying. And uh, this is, again, some of the, one of the places where we pick it up the most uh, frequently is on Gardenia, along with capsicum uh, and asclepias. So three major plants that if you were to go out and look and look in your environment around you, uh, I would concentrate on these three plants. Most people don't spray Asclepius because of the monarch butterflies. So there's a good chance that if it does land on there, that it may get established. This is a current known distribution of Thrips parvispinus. Now the red dots mean they were found in nurseries and stock dealers, which means commercial re uh, wholesale growers or they were found in retail outlets uh, on potted plants. Now, if it's on a potted plant that hasn't been put in the ground yet, it's just to consider the detection. Once these things get put in the ground and we find thrips on them, that county becomes uh, considered positive. Okay. As long as we don't find this thrips in a lot of different counties, this is basically considered a pest of limited distribution. If it's limited distribution, then they will basically, the DPI, FDAX, and APHIS uh, want this pest regulated. Once it's found in these places where we uh, people might have taken plants and planted them in the in landscape, it will become gray. And as we reach a certain point where it seems uh, widely distributed, they will change the rules. Okay. Once they change the rules, that allows us, and don't consider it a regulated pest anymore, but they will inspect your plants, and if you have too many on them, they won't let you move them, but it will allow people to, to actually uh, not have to spray for the thrips every time they found a single thrips, which is going to lead to resistance, and it's going to lead to major issues down the road that will have a pest, uh, the, the chemicals, the few that do work, won't work at all. So it's something that that we were, it's a fine line we have to walk between not sending them out and not sending out ones that are going to be more difficult to control. We're at a at a disadvantage considering Canada, uh, they can they can ship them now if they're found coming in. The plants are probably going to be regulated, but they are not held to the same standards, and they don't, uh, you know, they they don't have to begin nuking their plants if they find one. Okay. In Lance? Yes. Uh, we've got a couple of questions I think that would be helpful at this point. Okay. Um, if the Mark Stevens is asking, what happens on the retailer's part if they know that they have uh, thrips present on their plants? Uh, the retailer, uh, if, if first of all, if the DPI is involved, they're, they're basically, you know, they should try treating them. Uh, they should maybe contact whoever sent them those plants and let them know that they're infested. Uh, now, if DPI is brought into the equation, those plants either have to be destroyed, they have to be treated in place, or they can be shipped back to the to the dealer or okay. whoever sent them to them. Okay. And uh, Debbie Prizia asked if, if she sees them at a commercial place, what should she do or at a retailer? Well, what we would like to do is have samples, and I'll go through the, the okay. last couple of slides in this. Uh, sent samples to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Felipe Soto at uh, DPI, which will give you the address. Uh, but I would con I would contact the extension office first, okay, okay to make okay. sure that that everybody uh, do some triage and look and see if it looks like it is the thrips parvus minus. Then get them to somebody that can identify them, which uh, we uh, Nicole was uh, pushing hard to have. Dr. Soto, uh, look at them so they can make a decision of what to do. Right. And then uh, Barbara from Levy County is wondering, it looks like the symptom may appear on the upper leaf surface. Is that correct? And it, it appears on both surfaces. Some some of these plants, the thrips like to be on the bottom. And some of these plants, the thrips like to be on the top. For They seem to prefer it on Asclepius, but on some of the other plants, they, they go on the underside. So there's no right. generality. 
Okay. <laughs> they just want it all. Yeah. And the um and the negative uh green X on the county means that the the there was no thrips found in that locale. It, the, the, it's where somebody actually went out and looked, maybe have inspectors in this area. They've looked at the retail outlets and then uh, regular nursery inspections haven't found it. Okay. All right. And then uh, a couple others questions. Are there uh, any known predators of this insect here? I'll, or talk, not I'll here? talk about that okay. toward the end, but yeah, All right. there are. yes, there are. All right, I'm gonna let you go. Uh, okay. Sorry to break your stride, but no, thank that's you. fine. That's fine. I want to. Okay. I appreciate it. Okay. Oh, she's got spinning stars. That's cool. <laughs> okay, how to sample for Parvus minus? Okay, basically, what you need is if you find a suspicious plant, tips and or flowers, uh, the the foliage that uh, that might be damaged, put it in a Ziploc bag. But try to get the areas that are newly growing. They prefer the new growth. They like to be in an, a very tight area. So they like to be in the buds. They like to be in the new leaves that haven't opened up yet. So you have a better chance of getting a good sample that might contain act, active thrips and adults that can be identified. And then you put them in a the plastic bag, put a piece of paper towel. Uh, you don't want to put make it wet. You need to keep it dry. Uh, put a label in as much information as you can put uh, have and put it on the bag or in the bag, but make sure it's a a, a, a marker that, that doesn't uh, bleed from if it gets wet. OK, uh, include whoops. Include on the on the label, the date, host plant, location, the collector name. And if you want, uh, put some information, uh, if you want to get contacted and let if, and find out what, uh, you know, what's what it ultimately turns out to be. OK. Now, I'm going to show you something maybe toward the end that uh, the other people are, are doing, uh, but this is probably the, the simplest and easiest way. OK. Again, send this off, uh, either take the sample to your local extension agent or send to FDAX, DPI, Entomology, at 1911 Southwest 34th Street, Gainesville, Florida, 32608. Now, this will be up on the websites, and it will be uh, available if you email me, which you'll, if you go to the website again, you'll be able to uh, get my email and I can give you Dr. Soto's email and that sort of thing. Okay. And then uh, this will be also available. Whoops. Dr. Soto's, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Benda's uh, information. Why is this not working? It's, okay, that was a, I'm not familiar with the PowerPoint. So uh, this is this is the last slide really that we have for her. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of that and get back into my website, my uh, PowerPoint. So how do we think master gardeners can contribute? Uh, they can help with the detection by sending samples similar to what I just talked about uh, in Dr. Binda's uh, uh, presentation. We're also going to try to start a small project where we use and try to put out sentinel plants, plants that we know that haven't been treated with pesticides. We know that they're very sensitive uh, to damage by this particular thrips. It's easy to see the thrips on them, which would make it easier for uh, cooperators to detect whether they have them in their landscape. So we're going to try to enlist at least cooperators in each of the counties to, uh, to serve as local scouts, okay, to see if they can work, help with others uh, that think they might have issues. Uh, they can be contacts for, for both us and for uh, DPI in, the, in a given county. Uh, they can serve as intermediaries between county participants, DPI, and extension specialists, which is what I'm considered. Uh, we're going to try to supply the cooperators lens, uh, the cooperating uh, county uh, master gardener coordinator 
uh, with some hand lenses that could be used by the co cooperators so they can uh, in, in, use at least what we would use or the minimum requirement for being able to see the thrips that are running around on one of these uh, sampling devices or beat boards uh, to organize some kind of sample information, collection and transfer so we can train people to train other master gardeners, okay? Now, again, this hopefully might work into something long-term where we have uh, people in the field that can we can rely on when the next pest comes through, okay? With training and looking for and working with uh, DPI and extension specialists. Uh, they'll help in the distribution of the results, uh, websites, tra local trainings, and we have a listserv for this pest as well. So uh, just the types of things we want to work toward, we haven't gotten there yet. We just really appreciate uh, Dr. Wilbur getting this organized on sh such short notice that we were lucky uh, that that we have such a an outstanding master gardener program in this in this state. Okay, the probability of establishment of this particular pest in Florida greenhouses is high and it's already occurred. Uh, and it will probably establish outside. We know that it's established in the landscape in Palm Beach County where the gardenias, some of them haven't bloomed in over two years because of the thrips. The cold tolerance of this pest, we don't really know. So we don't know how far north it's going to be able to establish outside. This is something that Dr. Bend is working on in her lab up at DPI in Gainesville. Thrips management. Uh, it always starts with scouting, which is what we're talking about a lot here today, is scouting, how to identify it, how to, how to even sample for it. We recommend that you have a fairly good hand lens. You need about a 10x hand lens in order to see these things running around on the, on the plant. We talk about using beat boards, okay? This is just a Obviously, a clipboard with white paper. Now, a lot of times, it's white. when you bang the leaves against it, you'll get them wet, the paper wet and stained. And so you have to go through a lot of paper in, in many cases, depending on how much sampling you're going to do. My biologist uses a paint easel. Okay, but I, I use anything I can get, including the lid for a Home Depot bucket. So as long as it's hard and it's easy to clean, and it has a contrasting color to what the, the thrips look like, it's gonna work. This is a problem. She's probably got her hair full of thrips by now. Okay, so this, this might not be the best one to use, but what we do do, do use is uh, sometimes we'll get a, a plastic dinner plate and stick a yellow sticky card or a blue sticky card on it, okay? That you can buy at commercial stores and we if we get, volunteers, we can probably supply some of these as well. And basically we take a plant, in this case, it's going to be Asclepius and you hit it against. Now these are sticky, but they're not gonna pull the leaves off and they, your fingers aren't gonna get all gooed up and that sort of thing. You can see thrips running around. The little black things are parvospinous. One got stuck on my finger and then I rolled it off this is a sample that's not going to go anywhere, and it could be sent to us for diagnostic purposes. Uh, yellow sticky card does about the same, but it's not quite as sticky as the blue. So blue is actually better. Now, when you start doing this, you're going to get a lot of things running around on the, on the backboard. You'll get mites, you'll get springtails. These are what the thrips might look like if they're dark in color. This is part of a spinous. This is chili thrips in the middle there, and then the rest of these are other species, okay? So you're looking at the tiniest of the tiny. I mean, here's a pencil to give you kind of a lead so you can give you a kind of an idea what you might be looking for. As far as management goes, the landscapers, master gardener, there's nothing that I think you would be able to get in any kind of... Uh, you know, retail uh, garden center type situation that's really going to help you much with the exception of some soaps, oils, conserve, or spinosad. There are some other chemicals, but they are sold through uh, different outlets and may be difficult for uh, the general public to get a hold of and not things that we recommend at this point in time. We're still trying to figure that out. What we can do is tell you what not to use, okay? 
a lot of things that end in thrin, T-H-R-I-N, like bifenthrin or tau star, really probably do more harm than good, okay? This is an experiment we had. This is for water control, uh, no treatments. We did absolutely nothing. And you can see, you know, the plant still has some leaves on it. Well, chili thrips and parvospinus were on those on those plants. And when we treated them, we had a huge outbreak of thrips. We basically killed all the natural enemies that were in the greenhouse that were feeding on. Them. So there are biological controls that may have utility. Uh, right now, the jury's still out worldwide on biological control. They're getting a lot of uh, discrepancies. Some places they work, some places they don't. These things have a, are able to flick fecal material at predators, and the predators run away. So they have their own mechanism for de defending themselves from biological control agents. Predatory mites are... There's one thing that we're looking at, and there's a new predator that we're trying to find in the state of Florida. We know it. We know it's here, but we we just haven't been able to find it yet, which is called the crazy mite or whirly gig mite, which is bright red and runs around on a leaf like crazy. If you happen to see anything like that, we would really like to know. Aureus, minute pirate bug, uh, feeding on thrips. They feed on any stages. This is showing most. Of uh, really the most promise in some people's studies as far as a biocontrol agent. Uh, they don't overwinter. They go into diapause, but you can start releasing them in spring. You can buy them or you can pl put plants out in your garden that might attract them and feed them. And we can talk about that at another date. Not enough time here today. This is a predatory thrips. It's available in Florida and it's, uh, it's found uh, all winter long and in greenhouses, and here it's feeding on a stage of, of thrips. That's the adult. The immature stage is bright orange and red, and again, it can tackle the full-grown thrips. We used lacewing eggs in one study on anthuriums, and pe we had peppers as well. Uh, we don't have a good video of them eating bugs, but other than mealy bugs, but they'll eat anything they can catch, including themselves. And with that, I can take some questions. All right. Um, let's see what we have in the chat box. Um, Barbara from Levy County says she's got a lot of um, Asclepius. Um, plants and was wondering if maybe those could be used as sent how could we use these as sentinel plants i would i would just uh just go out and look at them look at the new growth look for uh the scarring like i showed uh so you might have little black dots where the excrement from the thrips is, but you're gonna probably need to either beat them on a white board to see if you see little black things running around or these say these strips are very skittish to count the ones in some of my experiments i kind of have to sneak up on the plant it's like they can tell i'm coming so they they they're they're a force to be contended with they're a pain to work with okay well barbara you know you might if you have a lot of uh a lot of those plants you may um pot them up and uh, distribute them to your master gardeners throughout the throughout your big county there um, and then have them mon have your volunteers monitor them. Um, so distribute the plants and sort of send them out is got an idea that I had, uh, Dr. Lance. So we'll see. Um, that's great. Right. I mean, that's uh, he, there's uh, organizations, uh, science on uh, monitoring for the monarchs and larvae and all that. So you could kill a, a number of important things uh, with okay. one fell swoop. Good, good. So uh, Camille Steen, uh, Stein said, in the event that we find thrips outside of office hours, how do we keep them alive until we send them out? How long will they live in plastic bags? Uh, can the sample be refrigerated? Uh, refrigeration will probably kill them. Uh, if you, you know, you can always take uh, a, if you have a little tiny bottle, you, you can you can take some alcohol and dab it on the thrips and put the individual thrips into a a small uh, vial or bottle of, of with uh, ethyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol in it, 
and then that could be shipped but it's not it's not wise to ship them with in the standard mail i mean they don't like so i, I i'm not sure what to say about that unless you take it into the master gardener then we can work on having extension or uh the dpi come get them okay um how important is it that they be alive when you receive them they don't have to be alive when we receive them or when okay. DPI, uh, DPI basically is going to kill them anyway. They just mount them on a slide. So we don't want them in a bag and rotting though, or getting fungal, fungal growth. Then you can't, can't identify them. Right, 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 right. Okay. Uh, are, are they, they, are they cold tolerant? Uh, so the question is about the, them in Canada, as well as maybe uh, freeze prone areas in Florida. Uh, basically, they are not as cold tolerant, uh, we don't think, as other thrips. The only reason they're surviving in Canada is because they're in greenhouses. They're in protected okay. ag. Okay, So we don't know how far north they're going to spread and survive outside of greenhouses. And have they been found on orchids? Not that I know of. Uh, I have to go back and look at that. Uh, I'm not, I don't remember it. I have an orchid uh, out there now uh, where there, and I haven't seen the first strips on it, but that doesn't mean anything. Uh, what you'd have to do is go to the website and look uh, right off the top of my head. I don't have the host list uh, memorized. Okay. And are all Asclepius uh, susceptible? They're wondering about the native milkweed. Uh, we would we don't have access to native milkweeds to put in a greenhouse to to run a a, a host strain study. So we're okay. in the process of gathering plant materials uh, to expose to thrips to find out what's at risk and what isn't. Okay, and is there any long range projection projections on um, the food crops? You know, I you mentioned that it did affect a lot of peppers. Um, are other food crops going to be an issue? Well, there there are a number that are listed on that uh, on that host okay. range. I mean, we do see it on uh, eggplant, uh, some solanaceous crops, uh, but we're not sure what's going to happen in the real world. Okay. Okay. All right. And um, do you know where you can get sticky paper? Uh, I get it. I at uh, one of our local grower supply houses now. I think you can get them at some of the retail outlets. I noticed one of our uh, kids that are running around here went and got a whole bunch of uh, sticky cards from, I think it must have been Home Depot or Lowe's. But I'm not, I, I really can't tell you. Uh, okay. If you have a hydroponic store near you, you could probably pick them up in a hydroponic store. Or And guess what? They have them at Amazon. So oh, yeah. Every, Amazon's going to have all these stuff. Yeah, they do. Oh, and I understand Island. where you are. You get same day delivery over there, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, if not controlled, um, how serious is the damage that's going to happen? Depending on a host plant, it can kill them. Okay. It takes out the new growth. Uh, we've had a grower that was growing anthuriums. That was one of the major crops he had and Hoya. Uh, he quit growing both. Wow. Wow. I don't like to hear that. And speaking of anthurium, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Block has said, we have seen these particular thrips in Miami-Dade on velvet leaf anthurium seedlings considering their life cycle reproduction time with early observation being a challenge due to their small size, what repeat spray treatment intervals are suggested? If you have them, we recommend uh, almost a four day rotation. That's what growers have had to use in order to break the life cycle. They, they, they can go through the complete life cycle in 14 days. The problem with thrips is they lay their eggs in the plant tissue. So chemicals don't really uh, affect the eggs. And the the, uh, the immature stages, they pupate and fall to the soil. So if you're unless you're spraying the, the soil, uh, there's another area, uh, the stage is protected from pesticides. And so you need to have the, the chemical sprays pretty close together. But I wouldn't be spraying every week unless you have a unless you see a lot of damage and you have to break the life cycle. Okay. Um, 
And if someone's asking if diatomaceous earth would help at all. I think you might see more damage to the plant than what, than what you would see from killing the thrips initially. Uh, okay. All well, right. all sales, I mean, that might work, but I, 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 I wouldn't go there right yet. Okay. Okay. Um, Barbara Edmonds uh, from Le Extension Agent in Levy County is asking, if you had a top five wish list of plants that you'd like to trial in the greenhouse, um, he could see if Master Gardeners are interested in scouting this project. So I think she's talking about maybe growing some plants and setting them up for scouting with the volunteers. So, uh. I'd be. I, I need to talk to her in person on that. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure what her goal <laughs> is. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. So Barbara, contact uh, Dr. Lance directly on that. And and so just to reiterate, if the master gardeners see them, they can do the sampling as described and probably bring them into their extension agent, and then the extension agent would contact DPI or get them shipped to you. Is that how you'd like it to go down? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever's easiest and get the samples. I mean, it's best if you have a way to get them directly to Gainesville. That's that's the best. But we will act as an intermediate and get them, collect what we can, and then take them to Gainesville or the DPI office here. Okay. Um. So like Clarissa uh, Cherez, who's closest to you and at the Orange County Extension office, is wondering if you could provide a um, protocol, like a one-page sampling protocol, just a sheet that. You know, we had, you know, we had close to 300 on the Zoom call today, but they would like to have a flyer perhaps uh, or a document we can have at the help desk. I think we can do that. Uh, we can, there is a, a pest alert just on the strips, but and mm -hmm. I would also want to put together a small handout on how to do the collection and sample collection, plus maybe even a video of how to do it. Okay. All right. So um, I will get with maybe, Nicole and we'll do okay. we'll, get that done all right and um when you when you have when you have that done if we will link uh set up a link to where that is also with the recording of this so we'll try to have these things as, as in as many places as possible to make them accessible okay. but thank you for that uh and susan is wondering do ants farm this species of thrips I don't think so. In some cases, I think they're helping get getting rid of them. Uh, these things are, like I said, they they are very skittish. So I've seen ants walk up to them and the thrips take off. Uh, so we have we have some ants in the greenhouse that are actually predators and probably eating them. Okay. Um, Mary Jo is asking, would it be helpful to scout plants in a residential community area? I think so. And it, it, you know, if you can get to some of the common uh, host plants that we know that they're causing problems on, if they have gardenia around, Asclepias, uh, we know that they we had a very large uh, planting of Ruelia in front of a CVS that was just heavily damaged. So they, which some people might think that's good, but <laughs> <laughs> you can yeah. tell by the look on my face. Well, is that a bad thing? Um, so, uh, the, uh, Dr. Block's asking about where the recording, the recording will be available on the Master Gardener, uh, web page where it usually is, where you go to the Master Gardener web page and then under volunteers, uh, education, that's where the webinars are. And I usually have that listed on the front page of Better Impact also, so you can quickly find that. And then Dr. Osborne's going to put it up in his lab page uh, that is dedicated directly to this uh, pest. And Doreen, I believe that we'll ask Dr. Osborne, we will ask Dr. Osborne to provide a PDF of his slides for today. And then you will um, be able to um, access the slides that way too. So you can review because even though it was, uh, it seems short, there was a lot of information packed in there because we we went from zero to 100, not 100, we went from zero to 70% understanding about these, about these pests. So, and then uh, Becky just put in the chat box where you can find the recording also. So if you want to go over the chat box and click on that, that's where the recording will be probably within a couple of days. Uh, so Dari is asking, she came in a little bit late and might've missed it. What are nurseries doing to prevent selling plants with thrips? 
Uh, they are basically applying a number of the, the pesticides that we've had the most eff efficacious results from. Uh, some They're scouting a lot better. The problem initially and the reason there was some problems is nobody knew this pest even existed, including myself. We had a plant that came into the greenhouse or our clinic and it, we couldn't figure out what was causing the issues. I put it in the greenhouse and my greenhouse is now treated like a, a nursery. I can't take anything out of that greenhouse. It's alive. So, you know, the, the growers are doing their best. Uh, many of ones that had major problems are not reporting uh, thrips issues anymore. Uh, but they're on a very rigorous, uh, right now, pesticide uh, schedule. Wow. Wow. And just from my own, um, you know, are are you, and I, you kind of are a master at this, you know, are, are you uh, beginning to do the research to look for those biocontrols out there? Yes, we have uh, a couple in, in culture already uh, that we're evaluating. Uh, Dr. Revnenthi at uh, Homestead. Myself and uh, Ahmed uh, Z uh, at uh, USDA, Dr. Ahmed, he's also on the grants as well. Great. Well, anything we can do to help, um, we're gonna we're gonna get our eyes and eyes and um, tapping boards and our sticky paper out there and and keep you uh, informed of what we're finding. And uh, we really appreciate it. So if you could uh, get us a PDF and then a one page sampling um, sheet, uh, that would be very very helpful. Okay, and I have to wait until uh, Dr. Benda returns before I can get the sampling thing done. Oh, um, just a couple more questions. I'm sorry. And then okay. we'll let you go. Um, the the thrip is uh, originally from Asia, correct? Correct. Uh, what part of Asia? India, India, we think. Okay, you think. And then, but it did, did it enter the U.S. through Canada? How was Canada involved? Uh, I think Canada and the U.S. kind of got at the same time from a plant, uh, dis tissue culture, whatever, place in another foreign country that uh, we we think sent anthuriums in uh, and liners and that sort of thing uh, because they reported problems a lot sooner than we did. Right, right. Okay. Um, and and then the, the first time it came, it showed up was when? Oh, geez. Uh, it's on the website, but I think it's like 2022 or 2020, something like that in Apopka, Florida. Uh, oh. But at the first time it was found outdoors, uh, attacking plants was like maybe a couple years ago. I'm sorry, these dates all kind of that's okay uh, meld together. But I think it's on the website, and it, there's a, a a pest alert that came out and has those details. Okay. And Camille, you asked, are nurseries, big box uh, stores required to notify UF if they find these thrips? No, that's the, um, we're not regulatory at all. We only do education and research. So that would go to the Department of Agriculture. Um, that would be their uh, purview. Okay. All right. Any closing comments, Dr. Osborne? We appreciate it. And anybody that's interested in being part of a, a little more detailed uh, reporting and following of the this issue, would I'd like to have you send us emails uh, so we can if we can see if your county has at least three uh, people that are willing to do this so we can work a, a larger safety net. And, all right. So contact Dr. Osborne with any other uh, questions or about getting together this team for scouting out there. So we really appreciate it, Lance, and hopefully we uh, will get get a real handle on this thing. Appreciate it. If Thank anyone can do it, it's you. We believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care, okay. everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.